How's it going, y'all? Jonathan here with Boston Collectors, and today I'm excited to share the latest updates to my Star Wars themed office space. In case you haven't followed my room tour journey since 2021, here's a quick rundown. I used to be a partner Twitch broadcaster, so my desk space originally accommodated those needs. When 2020 struck, I had to shift gears, so this space was utilized to work from home. During that time, I began collecting more, and I wanted to curate my space to fit my vision. In 2022, I did just that. The entire mood of the room shifted to a darker tone and became more of a museum of my favorite pieces that I get the pleasure to look at while I work. However, there were still a few things that I needed to upgrade along the way, but I wasn't in a rush. Today, it's safe to say I'm almost there. Since the last tour, I've made a few significant upgrades to my desk, so let's begin. One of the first things I do before I begin working is turning on the light for my desk space. Compared to a lamp illuminating a small section of the desk, I prefer the overall coverage of the screen bar while I'm completing tasks. Being able to change temperature and brightness within arm's reach is a huge plus for me and adds to the comfort of working. Well that and for some reason Apple's magic keyboard doesn't have a backlight. It's nice and all, but it's got its downsides. I'd prefer a 60% version versus this one though. I also upgraded to the Logitech MS Master 3S for the Mac. It took a while to get used to the scroll wheel on the side, but I find that I can't live without it. As for a small Star Wars related detail, I have a magnetic detonator to fidget with while I think. For Zoom meetings and voiceover content, I'm using the Logitech Blue Sona attached to my low profile mic arm by Elgato. I'm not an audiophile, so I'm sure there's room to tighten up the clarity and the overall output. Until then, I like where it's at and it works pretty well. Recently, my XLR input switched from the Roland to the Elgato Wave XLR. It's a much smaller footprint compared to the previous input I had, and it comes with everything necessary to get the job done. Not to mention, when it isn't in use, it looks good tucked away nicely under my desk shelf, which doubles for storage and monitor height. As for the smaller details, over the course of the summer I've been using Bololo's wool coasters and desk mat. I'd opt against these personally. It's better to invest in coasters that won't bend and fold, and a desk mat that won't clip the edges of the feet beneath your mouse. Since my job is centered in the creative space, I wanted to invest in a machine that could power my setup without worry. So I went ahead and upgraded from the PC to the Mac Studio M2 Ultra. I won't bore you with the specs, but I do miss gaming from time to time. With it, I also got rid of the two monitor setup, which I really do miss, and picked up the studio display featuring nano textured glass. I also like the ease of charging my phone, so I picked up the modular attachment to charge it while I work. While I'm editing, I like to throw on some lo-fi or my favorite Last of Us 2 tracks through my HomePod. She doesn't like to listen half the time, but the sound quality is pretty good. A while ago, I picked up an additional Bespin Luke stand that I used to display figures on my desk. This is a custom wall utilizing multiple pieces that I won't bore you with. If you're curious, I'm open to any and all questions. But the short and sweet answer is, I combine the entire upper body of the Phantom Menace mall with the lower half of the Clone Wars body. I want it more of an in-between stage for him after the season finale. Not to mention the display stand feels neutral across the board for any Star Wars character. While I am proud of my desk setup, it might be boring to most, so let's get to the room. Beginning with what I see while I'm at my desk, we have a canvas mural. I originally wanted to print my work, but I only have so much wall space. The inspiration for this purchase came from a gift I bought for my wife in 2022. 
She had learned about the Echo's capability to cycle through photos, and while I liked it, I didn't care for the quality of the image. That and the fact that the device reflects the room back at you from all sides. With the canvas mural, it's an anti-glare screen, and the sole purpose of this device is to show artwork. You can either upload the artwork to an SD card or the mural app on your phone. After waking up the device, your photos are up and ready for display. It isn't a perfect product, and even I have issues with it listening to me from time to time. The motion feature here is rather janky, and the picture quality is capped at 1080p. For me though, it works, and I like the way it fit into my workspace while either sitting or standing. If the swiping feature is rough on you too, you can utilize the app to swipe through other artwork. While there are a few downsides, the overall display does its job wonderfully. Not only are the images sharp, but the device knows to cycle through photos that correspond with its current orientation. Landscape photos will only showcase in landscape orientation. You can also edit the description, artist, and date of the photo taken, if you're as thorough as me. If not, you can skip this. The price tag is a bit of a rough pill to swallow, but this is the best option. Above that, we have a set of floating wall shelves. It adds much needed dimension to this side of the room, which was severely lacking. Currently, I only have a few items displayed, one of which being a random Geonosis battle droid that I'd like to stay indefinitely. On the other shelf, I have a few of my favorite books that I read this year. These won't remain due to their weight, unfortunately. I also went ahead and displayed an anniversary card my wife gave me. <laughs> this will be fleshed out before the next room tour, but the idea is to have these accent the room rather than be utilized as additional storage. So we'll have to wait and see. Moving around the room, I started pairing saber hilts with a lot of my prints for a bit more depth and immersion. One massive upgrade to consider is the anti-glare acrylic that doesn't reflect the room back at you. You'll see more of that in a moment. The Saber Hilt is from Disney's Galaxy's Edge and fully functional in the event that I lock Blaze with my wife. Speaking of my wife, she gifted me this beautiful art print for our anniversary titled Dark Lord of the Sith. I was lucky enough to get an earlier version with mine being 103 out of 400 not to mention also being signed by artist Darren Tan. Moving down, we have the final set for this particular wall. Beginning with the print, this was one that I'd picked up a while ago titled Savage Rage. Another one with an earlier copy at 182 out of 450 and signed by artist Brian Rude. The wall space here is rather small, but the dynamic appearance does a phenomenal job at waking up this corner of the office. For his saber, I wanted the Clone Wars appearance, so I picked up the Phantom Menace hilt and the Shadow Collective hilt to tie it all together. I'd love to add plaques to the wall, but it would appear a bit too cluttered for my tastes. These guys don't need an introduction, but it would certainly add a premium feel to the pieces if I could. For now, I'm still figuring out lighting. Ahsoka's print above the door received the same anti-glare upgrade to the acrylic. Being closer to the light source, this was necessary. This particular print was picked up from Acme Archives Direct titled The Path Before You. If you watched last year's room tour, she's probably the only one in the same spot as before. I say that because these two will definitely be moving on. There's a bigger idea to this wall that I'm extremely close to fleshing out, and I can't wait to see how it all come together. Looks like you'll have to wait until next year. For now, this print came from Sideshow titled The Duel, Ray. Completing the set, we also have the Duel, Kylo Ren. These didn't receive the anti-glare upgrade, but I'm glad they didn't because I wanted to show off just how crucial it is to have. It's pretty nasty looking and doesn't show off the art properly enough for me, but it could work for others. I took down my grail print, which will end up on the wall where Kylo and Rey are currently. An obscure hint to what's to come, if it counts as one. 
This was a Christmas gift from my wife, so the bigger idea will be centered around moments like these that I love in Star Wars. So stay tuned for that. Since we're here, the Rebellion rug from Ruggable hasn't changed. It's been a full year since I've covered it, and the quality of the design is still intact. I'd prefer more of a Republic era rug, but it gets the job done and the colors match the overall tone of the room. As mentioned last year, due to the design, it does a great job at guiding me into the room while expressing my love for the Star Wars universe. With the office space out of the way, we can finally jump into the collection. If you're enjoying the content, don't forget to like this video as it support what we do and help others to see it. Beginning with the first display cabinet, we have the top shelf featuring an intimidating stare down courtesy of the Empire. Last year, I had everyone set up as protectors for Moff Gideon, but I wanted them to feel more like guard dogs instead. By bringing Moff Gideon closer to the front of the shelf, we're able to bring out more of the definition in his facial features is seen here. Flanking both the left and right of Moff Gideon, we have a pair of death troopers ready to execute their orders. I wasn't around when Rogue One specialists were available, but I am glad I got a second chance to pick these up, even if they are just standard grunts. These are troopers I wish came without the extra sand in the grooves of their armor, but I get why they did. Lastly, we have a pair of dark troopers bringing up the rear. These are actually cleaner, and I like it. One of my favorite pickups in terms of Imperial troops, too. I just can't decide on if I should get one more to slightly lead them while looming behind Moff Gideon. For now, it's exactly where I like it, and I'm satisfied with it. Stay tuned at the end of this display to learn why it's set up the way that it is. As we head down to the second shelf, I have my Bounty Hunter display. With Fennec leading the charge, it was only right to have her pose with her bucket off to the side and the others just waiting for a paycheck. I would have opted to have her displayed with her helmet, but at the risk of damaging her portrait, eh, she never will. Off to her right, we have Durastil Mando with a slight helmet modification. We'll explain why later, but I personally like the character of this design far more than the upgraded Beskar look he has today. To the left of Fennec, we have Cad Bane. This was a figure I knew I had to have due to his history throughout the Clone Wars. He also popped up in the Bad Batch alongside Fennec, which is another reason to loop them all together. It's all about a dollar for them at the end of the day, so it was only right. In the back, we have IG-11 as seen in The Mandalorian. I get why too many people didn't pick him up, but the engineering behind this piece is incredible. I also couldn't pass up on another bounty hunter that I liked either. While Total 360 isn't exactly a bounty hunter, I couldn't just have him stuffed away. So instead I brought him out with a Camtono and a decent chunk of credits in Beskar. It's something about having this band of misfits together and having them appear like they could care less about each other that I really like in the display. It's the only shelf like it, and I dig it. Making our way to the third shelf, we have the Tribe. I wanted to represent Season 1 of The Mandalorian after Din received his Beskar armor upgrade. Although I'm still waiting for Hot Toys to announce the woman presenting Mando to finish up the overall feel. Kicking things off, we have the Heavy Mandalorian, later known as Paz Vizsla. I didn't feel the need to pick up the reissue because I liked what I have here. If you're able to pick him up, he'd get a recommendation from me. Leading them front and center, we have the Armorer. She isn't exactly the best release, but her representation is all I needed. I doubt I'd pick up her 2.0 later on, but never say never. She's still available as of the making of this room tour, so if you're looking, now's the time. Tying together the Nomad style of the shelf, I have a Death Watch Mandalorian. He's a custom piece featuring several different items from the likes of Axe Wolves by way of armor and Qui-Gon Jinn's poncho. He's also seated on the throne, which came with Solo Darth Maul's release to add a bit of height dimension to the group. Lastly, we have the Beskar Mandalorian release with a slight upgrade. 
At its core, this is the Season 1 version of the figure, but I upgraded his armor from the original dull Beskar. All I had to do was wash away the debris on the armor from the Season 2 version and simply attach them to the figure. This look is before obtaining his Mudhorn Signet. I wanted this display set at a particular point in time, prior to all of his adventures. Regardless, if you're looking to upgrade your armor, you can check out websites like Toy Anxiety and Monkey Depot, where pieces are occasionally parted out. This is probably my favorite look to Din Djarin in the collection due to the lighting on the figure. Having him right below the light source make him feel like a threat even though he's just hanging out. With this release, Grogu was packaged inside, so tucking him behind Din felt like the right thing to do. Altogether, I couldn't ask for a better look to this coven. I just need that final addition to complete the circle. For the final shelf, I have my take on Ahsoka's journey between Episode 8 and 9 of The Clone Wars after joining Bo-Katan. While this might not be 100% accurate, the idea of it is there for me and it's more than enough. Leading them, I have the Mandalorian release of Bo-Katan. There aren't any modifications to this figure at all, even though I'm wrestling with the idea of changing her body out. Next up, this is the Clone Wars release of Ahsoka Tano, which you will be seeing again later on. It was only right to see her again in the Mandalorian series, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The mixture of animation and live action is superbly done, and I'm happy to have her represented in this section of the display. Behind her, we have Axe Woves. A decent release, but not having a portrait doesn't sell for this figure, unfortunately. If I were to use the portrait for Casca and Bo, it would look strange having him with his helmet on. Speaking of Casca, she's an undeniable release, and her portrait should be considered top 5 in every argument made this year. It was difficult to say no to having her in the collection, and would only look weird not having her alongside bo -Katan. Last year this poor guy was solo, but he's finally got his group and he's bringing up the rear of the final shelf. The Death Watch Mandalorian almost got a perfect review outside of the bodysuit, which can be removed. He's a great addition to any Clone Wars setup and Mando collection you have. I like how well the different shades of blue work hand in hand between all of them and the subtle complementary color of Ahsoka's skin. I'm happy with where this display is and it's final in terms of where I'd like it to be. This entire unit was pieced together with Moff Gideon in mind and how he viewed the Mandalorians. By having bounty hunters as the second shelf shows he trusts them before any Mandalorian. If he had any level of respect for them, any coven would be ranked third before bo -Katans. And that's exactly why her display is ranked last. An insult to injury in Gideon's eyes and another nod to how the Empire is always on top. Moving over to the next Dechoff, we have Grand Moff Tarkin and the Coruscant Guard. We don't have an Admiral representation of Tarkin, so this will have to do. Seeing him show up in the Bad Batch to decommission all of the clones sucked to see, but showed just how much he didn't like them either. By having him lead while standing under the light source, the shadows in his face add to the darker goal of the character that the clones aren't really privy to. Well, that and the overall portrait design is truly remarkable to see in hand. Behind him I have four Coruscant guards as his escort. There isn't really anything special going on here outside of good soldiers simply following orders. Although at some point I'd love for Hot Toys to release the phase one version of Commander Fox so that I could swap figures around a bit more freely in the display. Heading down to the second shelf, we have the 332nd Battalion before the Siege of Mandalore. This is a pivotal moment for Ahsoka's journey, and a storyline that ended so beautifully yet extremely tragic. At the head of the battalion, we have Advisor Tano, released as simply Ahsoka Tano. Forgive the technical wording of this section, I just love the series. You can't have the 332nd without having her. And as of this recording, she's still available for purchase from Sideshow. Behind her, we have Art Trooper Jesse ready to assist in the attack. 
He isn't exactly the best trooper to pose and he can't execute Order 66 with his dual blasters aimed high, but he does look really cool. Coming back up front, we have Commander Rex holding a hollow projector after receiving a transmission from a nearby lag gunship. This is another must for a display like this. No explanation or introduction needed. It's a figure that's been heavily discounted for a while as of this recording. Next up, we have Captain Vaughn. His story was short-lived and the price tag didn't exactly reflect that. Either way, this is another clone that couldn't be left out of the final display. Lastly, we have four 501st Deluxe clones serving on behalf of the Republic. There were some 501st and Shinies present during the siege, but for this shelf, I only wanted the 332nd Battalion. With that said, this shelf is final until further notice, and I'm happy with where it is. As we continue to the third shelf, it's a little bland. Hot Toys isn't exactly dropping Jedi characters left and right to flesh out our collection, so I can only make do with what I'm given. Up front, we have Master Yoda as seen in the Attack of the Clones. His appearance could shift around quite a bit in the collection, but I'd rather have him here with fellow Jedi. Next up, we have Master Qui-Gon Jinn as seen in The Phantom Menace. I'd say this figure is a bit of a sleeper piece, unless of course you love the character. Posing him dynamically is a bit difficult due to the hair sculpting and hindering movement, but for me, he'll always have more of a generic stoic pose. For the final piece, I have a kitbash Plo Koon utilizing more Hot Toys parts than Sideshow. This figure ended up getting a lot of attention in the last room tour, and I didn't expect it. So today, I'm giving all the information on how you can make this piece yourself. But before we do, here's one final look at the Jedi on Coruscant that I look forward to fleshing out more. Plo Koon's a lot more posable than you think, but his portrait hinder those crazy dynamic poses that I'd like to have him in. Without breaking down everything verbally, here's a screenshot of my list and the expenses of each part in order to make him. All of these were purchased at different times from Toy Anxiety, but you will have to keep an eye out for daily part outs. With Mace Windu dropping eventually, there are a few parts of his that I'd like to incorporate into my custom for a refined look. His tabbers being the main change, but that's a future problem. While I don't have an issue with my piece, I will point out one thing that is inaccurate, and it's his height compared to Anakin. Anakin's taller than Master Plo, so you'll need a body slightly shorter than the one I chose. Again, I'm content, and I'm more than happy with what I have for now. For the final shelf in this display, I have a modest portion of the Separatist army and their leader Darth Tyrannus, otherwise known as Count Dooku. While I'd love more B1 battle droids, I'm okay with having just a few for the time being. Count Dooku's presence at the head of the army exude what was felt during the Clone Wars for me. By positioning him just below the lighting, his features appear a bit more ominous. This display isn't final due to waiting for the Super Battle Droids to release. In the meantime, I like where it is. Moving over to the third cabinet, I have the beginning stages of Darth Vader in the Inquisitorius. I look forward to filling out this display and hopefully getting the chance to have cooler pieces like Second and Ninth Sister. I'd even go for an Inquisitor Cal, but we shall see. For now, the foundation is laid and I'm hoping we don't have to wait for a 5 or 10 year anniversary to hope for more. Beginning with Darth Vader, this is his costume as seen in The Empire Strikes Back. I was more than content with this figure for a long time until the Kenobi version went up for pre-order, which he's definitely coming home. For the final piece, we have the Grand Inquisitor. For what it's worth, this figure isn't terrible. There are interesting design choices for the armor that I can't quite wrap my head around, but the overall execution of the piece is well done. I just wish his hood weren't stitched together and he came with his helmet as seen in Star Wars Rebels. This isn't a review though. Their combined presence is intense and demands a top shelf seat in the collection. 
Unfortunately, there are only so many top shelves, but there's an order to it that will make sense as we continue. Last year, Lord Vader stormed the Jedi Temple without the 501st, but this year, he isn't alone. With Ahsoka's shelf parallel to this one, there were clones that were released, which allowed me to move two standard 501sts around. I was also able to add Commander Oppo and the Heavy Weapons clone with them. Here I have Dark Side Anakin leading the charge, the anger in his eyes concealed in the shadow of his hood hiding any visual level of threat seen in his face. As mentioned previously, we have the Heavy Weapons clone trooper off to the right of Lord Vader. While this figure can flow between multiple displays, he looked better here alongside Commander Oppo. I didn't pre-order the Kenobi 501st due to the difference in clone appearance in the display. They could only work here, and I didn't want that. If push come to shove, I can always move these clones around, but I wouldn't be able to with those. With this display finally set, I have to say it adds to the overall dark feeling presented on the shelf. On the third shelf, we have Jedi General Anakin and Obi-Wan and their respective officers, Captain Rex and Commander Cody. There are a few shiny sprinkled in, but we'll get to them shortly. Beginning with Obi-Wan as seen in The Revenge of the Sith, it also works as a Clone Wars appearance, which is what he's representing for me. I'm still excited for the earlier Clone Wars version of him, but you really can't go wrong having this one in the collection. In fact, it was a must for me. Co-leading the charge, we have Anakin Skywalker as seen in Revenge of the Sith. Similar to Obi-Wan, this appearance can represent Season 7 of Clone Wars as well. And you guessed it, this is representing the Clone Wars for me. There's so much history here that I couldn't go without having them in the same display. Like so many others, if I wanted to, I could split them up and change things around, but... I like where they are, for now. Behind Obi-Wan, we have Commander Cody. Another must in the collection for me, although he doesn't have a legion to command as of this recording. Behind Anakin, we have Captain Rex, who's leading one too many 501sts in the collection. Where there's Anakin, I'd like to have Captain Rex when I can, if it makes sense. I wanted this display to have the 212th behind them, but I only have a few shinies present to fill in. Awesome releases, and they do work filling in, but I'd like the 212th Legion instead. I think the shelf does a great job encapsulating a memory in Vader's life, which is what I was going for, but even on its own, it looks solid. On the final shelf of the third unit, we have Anakin Skywalker during the earlier years in the Clone War, and about the halfway mark. This was supposed to be a coming-of-age display, but I'm currently between ideas and how I want it to be. I'm leaning away from that idea, but I think you all will like what I'm thinking for 2024. Even though my mid-season Anakin share the same portrait as the Clone Wars variant, the clothing makes them feel different from each other for me. Starting with the official release of Anakin by Hot Toys, we have the Clone Wars movie representation of him seen here. However, I was aiming for the Season 2 Episode 5 version from my collection. As for my custom Anakin, this took a lot of patience to build up over the last year. Believe it or not, he isn't complete just yet, but he's almost there. I'm satisfied with how he turned out, but I can get a little picky sometimes. I'm sure this is easy to figure out how I put them together, but if you all need a breakdown, let me know. Running over a few details though, I wanted the season 3 to 6 version in the collection, so... After scrubbing through as much content as I could, I collected pieces made by Hot Toys to construct what I have today. I'd just like to have the royal blue tabbers from the Attack of the Clones Anakin to finally complete them. But as I said, I'm more than happy to have him in the collection as is. For a quick comparison, you can see the idea of the Empire's rise over time. The beginning of Order 66 and what we know will happen to Ahsoka, to the Jedi Masters in the console chambers, and generals on the battlefield. 
The final shelves are a work in progress, but they will be ready for next year. Moving over to the fourth DTOF, I have two Purge Troopers leading the top display. They weren't terrible releases, but a lot of the armor is rather loose and make them feel a bit strange in hand. Other than that, I couldn't help but buy them in pairs and they look great together. It's a shame they don't fit with the Inquisitors due to shelf space, but they're good here for now until Obi-Wan's release from the Kenobi series. I'm considering them having Kenobi shackled as if they could really contain him. <laughs> Displayed here on the second shelf, we have a few good soldiers following orders. The good thing about the standard clone releases is that they can work between both the Republic and the Rise of the Empire. Speaking of the Rise of the Empire, we have Crosshair flanked by a few regs. We don't have the Imperial version of him just yet, but here's hoping. He looks good in the display leading his troops to serve the Empire, at least for now. I also had him drop his bucket to signify letting go of Clone Force 99. Now, you've seen these present on an earlier shelf behind Anakin and Obi-Wan. But, like I said, these guys can work between any shelf in the display, which makes it fun. If you can't tell, I really like my clones, and this is by far one of my favorite releases of them. My not-so-favorite strictly due to pricing would have to be the Chrome clones. I'm happy to have them, but the price hurt. I also took a few liberties that we'll discuss shortly. Last year I mentioned picking these up in hopes of Hot Toys releasing Padme at some point. Less than a month later she was announced and I couldn't be happier. I wanted these guys appearing as elites stemming from the 501st and serving as personal bodyguards to Padme. In order to get that look right, I went ahead and gave both clones an ammo pouch magnetized to their breastplate. I also got rid of their DC-15s and swapped them for the Death Watch Mandalorian carbines. And, well, now we wait. On the final shelf in this unit, we have Clone Force 99 barging into Hot Toys' HQ to free their brother's wrecker and tack. Kicking things off, we've got Hunter securing the right side of the facility with his DC-16 and Vibro knife drawn. Leading the charge, we have Echo, who was able to download the entire layout of the place before shipping out. Armed with a scomp link and his DC-16 set to stun, we might get some answers soon enough. And for the final member, we have Crosshair, assisting with long-range support. When they all come together, I doubt any crazy poses could be pulled off here, but I look forward to the entire unit at some point. For the fifth unit, we have Darth Maul representing the top shelf. Since the Clone Wars Darth Maul didn't come with his throne, Thanos' bases would have to do. I'd love to have a Rebels version of him, but after what happened with his last release, I can't say I'd be too happy, but who knows. I took a few liberties with mine and gave him the half-cut lightsaber from the Phantom Menace Maul and the dark saber from Moff Gideon. He's unable to sit down properly on the base, but if you look close, there's a small water top to fill the gap. This is still the lowest rated figure I've reviewed on the channel to date, but I also couldn't go without having him either. To the right of him, we have the Phantom Menace Darth Maul, who was part of an era that we don't really see too often these days. I'm lucky enough to have him in the display due to my wife gifting him to me years ago. And lastly, we have Maul from the Solo movie. The hood is a bit strange, but I wanted it up to alleviate the same look of both portraits between this one and the Clone Wars version. I love this one too. He's an imposing piece to have in the display. It was also important to have each version of Maul holding different hilts. While the Clone Wars hilt was fine, it was the power behind calling himself the ruler of Mandalore that I wanted most. For the next shelf, we have the undisputed 2020 champion of Star Wars. The Mandalorian brought back so many characters that we love and I couldn't have him flanked by anyone else other than Luke and Ahsoka. The season two Beskar Mandalorian is mostly untouched and left as is for the most part with one change. 
This was important in the event that I have him centered around his previous appearances in the collection. I have him and the others posed in a standoff for a reason, and that reason is to protect Grogu. This is the same version that released with Mando, since I don't like the weird look of the articulated arms with the Grogu's released later. To his right, we have a calm and collected Ahsoka ready to strike. This is a beautiful piece to have in the display. While it's got its issues, and it wasn't a perfect release, the craftsmanship to her body sculpt is beyond words. This piece earned its spot in the display for sure. To the left of Mando, we have Luke Skywalker. In the show, Luke practically danced around anything that got in his way, and I wanted that look to the pose. His standard stances are cool and all, but I wanted something that felt different. No use of the force, just his skill with a lightsaber. And combined, you wouldn't want to be in the way of these three. On the third shelf, we have the Daimyo and his father Jango Fett behind him. I made minor adjustments to his pose, but it's practically the same. Last year, Jango was paired up with Count Dooku, but I felt having him behind Boba felt better. It doesn't execute the idea of a ghost very well, but it's the thought that counts. This piece doesn't need an introduction, but if you aren't aware of it, this is the repaint Boba and Throne. A killer set to have in any display, if you have the space. Overlooking his son's rule, we have the father of clones, Jango Fett. He may or may not go back with Dooku, but we'll see later on. For now, I like them paired up here. For the final shelf, we have another favorite of mine. I'm holding out hope for the black garb Tuscans even still. It's rough to see how cheap this set is going when I paid full price at the time. Regardless of that, I like this appearance of Boba. The Tuscans are on the expensive side of things, but in hand you really do understand why. However, my intention wasn't to get too many of these guys, because I wanted other variations from the Boba series. I'm still hopeful. Leading them we have the robed Boba from the two-pack set. It isn't too different from the other portrait outside of the subtle scarring changes in the paint application. I may go back and change up the posing a bit to see how I feel about another Tuscan, but until then I like where they're at. For the sixth and final detolf, we have Jedi Master Luke Skywalker, Rey Skywalker, and Supreme Leader Kylo Ren. I love the way they're displayed because it also showcases how his teachings went with both of his students. The brighter clothing with Rey and the darker colors on Kylo becomes somewhat infused with Luke's clothing. That and they just look badass on the same shelf to me. Crate Luke for me was a must have. While his portrait could be better, the representation of him was good enough for me. Off to his right we have Rey. She's still holding up pretty well considering her arms are made from silicone. Although I don't pose her so she should be safe. This appearance of her is cool, and I look forward to her character development in future Star Wars content. But you can't deny the portrait design for this release. Off to Luke's left, we have Kylo Ren. I'll still argue to this day the original hair prototype was far better than what we have. But you can't deny the portrait design for this release. There isn't much else to do here without throwing off the feeling of the shelf, so I'll bite my time until further notice. For the second shelf, we have Bespin Luke Skywalker as seen in The Empire Strikes Back. If you haven't checked out my review for this figure, I'll have a link in the upper right hand corner of the screen. This was probably my favorite intro that I've ever created, but the figure wasn't a perfect release. For what it's worth though, he looks really good set up in the display. For the third shelf, we have Mayfeld and Mando stealing from the Empire. The crates were 3D printed and painted by the good people over at Galaxy Diorama, so check them out and let them know we sent you. Here we have Mando digging through crates looking for something to help them find Grogu. 
And here we obviously have a not so inconspicuous Mayfeld alerting Mando to someone watching. Head on it might look a little strange, but they're posed in relation to where I sit at my desk. Technically, I'm the ruler of this empire that is my collection, so it, it makes sense. A small indication as to who's who can be seen with Mando, who doesn't care about Imperial Protocol due to his religion. If you all are interested in learning more about these Imperial crates, let us know down below. We made a mini review over on Instagram if you'd like to see more. Before a deeper dive, we consider it here for YouTube as well. For the final shelf in the last display, we have Finn, FN2187, and Luke Skywalker. This is sort of a hodgepodge unit, but I'd probably cycle out Luke in the event that I find Captain Phasma later. Front and center, we have Finn with Rey's lightsaber drawn. Like Rey, I look forward to his character development later on in the future of Star Wars content because he really need it. Well, that and a portrait upgrade because it's starting to show its age. Beneath him, I added a First Order helmet to signify his growth beyond the First Order in becoming who he's meant to be. And who he grew from, being FN2187 behind him. This, for me, is a grail piece in the collection. All I had to do was find an additional jacket for him to hold before switching out his armor for clothing. I still think Hot Toys dropped the ball not releasing the final appearance of Finn, but unfortunately, it is what it is. I'm just happy to at least have this one after so long. For the last piece, we have arguably the best Mark Hamill likeness created by Hot Toys. The figure looks amazing, but it's really the portrait that sell it. I'm unsure why they didn't put this one with the Jedi Master version of him, but I'm glad to at least have it here. And with that, the room tour is finally complete. Shout out to Luke Lights again for the incredible upgrade to the Detoff display. If you'd like to learn more about how to get the lighting seen in my collection, check out the video in the upper right hand corner of the screen. If you have any questions about anything seen today, ask away in the comments. There's no reason to gatekeep with collecting and I'm willing to answer any questions pertaining to it. Thank you all for your patience and more importantly, thank you for your time. The support this year means a lot to us, and you all show that by commenting and checking out the latest videos when we drop them. We're hoping to get back into the swing of things if we're able to. Life can hit pretty hard, but we're still standing and that's what matters. This is Jonathan with Boston Collectors. Happy Holidays and Happy New Year to you and your loved ones.